Pryor. Welcome to the Reluctant Agilist. Ryan Ripley is here today. Ryan, say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and Ryan's here because he posted something that started off a giant Twitter battle. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, my God, I really want to do an, a, a conversation about this. So this is not like a tutorial. This is meant to be two people with slightly different opinions that I think are kind of in alignment, just digging into a topic that gets a lot of people worked up. Um, so before we entertain the topic, Ryan, how would you describe the many different things that you do to the people? Like if you met somebody on the street and they were like, what do you do? I would describe it as exhausting. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, my, I'm, I'm Ryan Ripley. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a professional scrum trainer with scrum.org. So I teach a lot of scrum and Kanban and all sorts of other, um, fun, agile tricks and techniques and frameworks. Um, co-founded Agile for Humans with Todd Miller. So we do a lot of training, consulting, teaching. Um, I think the biggest thing we've been working on lately is a YouTube channel. So we've put, we had a goal last year in 2022 to post a video every day, and I think we achieved it. Wow. So over 300, I think almost 400 Scrum questions answered on the YouTube channel. We've done series with Dan Vacanti on Kanban, on Agile metrics. Um, great Agile coaches have come on and talked about Agile. I mean, there's just a ton of content there. So yeah. if you want to check out That's a YouTube, lot of work, too. It's a ton of work. Um, and other than that, we wrote a book, Fixing Your Scrum. And so YouTube, book, classes, and uh, occasionally sleep in between. How about that? <laughs> and and read Christmas stories to young children when, you're, when yeah. the time arises. You know, um, that picture, um, so if, if we're friends on Facebook, what, what Dave's been, he's talking about a, uh, I re we read Twas the Night Before Christmas. That book was the book that my wife's father read to her. Wow. When she was a, a two, three, four, five year old. And so, that's very yeah, cool. that, uh, we get that book out and read to the kids and then her dad tears up and she gets all of, you know, it's just good, good yeah. tradition trying to pass it on. That's cool. Um, yeah. All right. And a happy belated Christmas. So we're recording this right oh, after yeah. Christmas. Same um, to you. All right, so I'm going to read the tweet. I opened my phone. Mm. I think I was actually teaching a class when I saw this. <laughs> it said, if you are sitting in a scrum training class and the trainer starts teaching story points, you should, one, get up, two, demand your money back, and three, walk out. You're wasting your time. And yeah. I am now showing that in my class right before I <laughs> teach story points. Um, so <clears throat> I think if anybody knows Dan Vacanti's work, I would assume they understand where you're headed with this conversation. Yep. But I wanted to kind of explore what led to that and, and why you think it's a bad idea. You know, it's, so the tone is definitely very aggressive. Um, it's more, more direct uh, than what perhaps we've done in the past. Look, it's been 20 years <clears throat> and we still have people clinging to story points as if they're meaningful. And Dave, I don't have a problem with, with trainers teaching them as a stepping, do stepping stone to something greater, which I think is okay. what you do. Yeah. Um, I think you're basically saying, look, let's dip our toe into some something different than time estimates and then move on. But from my perspective, we've been arguing about this for 20 years. Yeah. We've been kind of soft handing <laughs> a lot of this stuff and it yeah. hasn't changed. Yeah. And so part of the, the the tone of the tweet is just really, all right, we need to move past this. And someone okay. needs to say something definitive uh, because it's well, it, our community is full of it depends yeah. Well, it depends on you context. You got to do the hands when you say it. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> it depends, and and they wave their hands and they collect their two fifty an hour, and yeah. they go and they go away. And I, I've, Todd and I have just gotten to the end of our rope on that. It's, um, no, we need to actually be more directive. And so in this case, velocity and story points, um, I see little value in them. Okay. Because from the so let me let me clarify something. I think planning poker is excellent. Okay. I think planning poker is a great analytical tool for discussing work, for breaking down work, for yeah. discovering assumptions and missing pieces of information. A great tool for teams to use. I wish they would treat I wish scrum teams would treat planning poker like whose line is it anyways, where the stories are made up and the points don't okay. matter. Right? Throw the points out, yeah. but have those great discussions. Because once those points get on there. Um, I think it's it, there's more confusion uh, than value. And confusion if you really in the team or out, is it is it? I mean, 
the numbers when the numbers escape the team and other people right. start armchair quarterbacking stuff is that where it gets bad like if we're all on the team and we all agree like this is a two kenny g sucks then we all agree to that right <laughs> right um good point uh, i think within the team uh there the initial confusion is what the heck is a story point okay Right. And then so we can teach that we can say, but but even amongst the gurus. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm not one of those, but there's others out there. If you ask Ron Jeffries, Mike Cohn, um, you know, Kretzman shows up and gives a definition, whoever it is that you're talking about, they all have a different definition of story point and velocity. OK. Right. Some people will say it is a combination of complexity, effort and time. But then you say define complexity and they go blank define effort and they go blank but huh. all they can tell you is time right and so and okay. some people might say well complexity is snowden's kneffen model or complexity is this okay quantify it make it make sense and and they go blank again and so these are very it's all subjective terms that mean yeah. different things to different people you know mike Cohn would say story points are all about time ron jeffries would say yeah it was always meant to be so, a story point was supposed to be something less than a day you know, Kretzman's talking about complexity, effort, time. He has some great blog posts defending um, those things. Okay. There's all sorts of people out there, but the definitions, you know, you talk to the latest scrum trainer. You teach it one way, Dave. Yeah. Jeff Watts teach, teaches it another. By the way, respect you and Jeff a, a ton as trainers, and so that's not a knock. It's just yeah, I think we all it's have a in, different way of coming at this thing. Right. But when you yeah. look at it, um, what I think it boils down to is that we spend a lot of time, effort, and energy trying to explain a thing that really just represents a lagging indicator of our yeah. capacity. Yeah. And so why well, are we struggling with this? Okay. So I want to I want to I want to go now and I want to talk about where how, where I come to it from. So my background sure. is traditional project management. And yep. when I took my CSM class, I took it with Cone, and I actually raised my hand and said, "This is stupid." Like we should just use hours. If I'm a I'm a project manager, I know how much you suck at estimating. I just fix your estimates. They literally threw things at me. Yeah. Um, which you should never be. Nobody should be estimating work for the people that are going to do the work. First of all, right. We both agree to that. Um, and I always tell people like, if you want to use hours, fine. Just use hours. Like no one cares. It's fine. But even though I fought against story points for probably the first four years of doing this stuff. I've come to, to think of them as really, really valuable, not because they tell me anything about capacity, not because they're ever right. I think they're completely useless as a metric beyond the team, but it's the process, like you said, the poker planning conversation or the affinity estimation conversation. Why is this bigger than this? And if it's complex, just simply, do, do you understand this or not? If you don't understand it, it's complex. It's like, it's that easy. Is it more complex than this? Um, it's the, the, the value of it to me is the conversation and getting the team into that same headspace where they can say like, yes, this is a one. Yes, we don't like Kenny G. Um, that's, I'm just trying to get them in sync. Yeah. I, and I think that's fine. If, if we're playing planning poker and the goal is to get the team, it's, I basically see planning poker as a refinement tool. Yes, we're we're we are bringing transparency to the work. Transparency meaning we're making the work more or more well understood. Finding what we don't members. know. Yeah, right. Totally agree. And then then podcast over. Discussion ended. We both agree. Um, <laughs> no, the problem is <laughs> no. But you know what I mean there. But the problem is the story. The the points escape, and yes. and then or or even the team they can get very dependent on. How many times have you heard a team say, "Yo, hey Dave, we got half of this story done." We think some of it's going to carry over. How should we score the points this sprint? I have a very, <laughs> I'm very directive in my response to that. And my answer is, who cares? You didn't get it done. You don't get any points. Right. Why are you worried about points? Exactly. Go figure out why you can't get something done. Yep. Same page. But the, but the conversation goes to these, but Dave, where do I get my points? Or Ryan? It's like, yeah. Why? Who cares? It's, it's like, stop. Um, so you think that, it's the attachment to the point as, as a thing where like acquiring like magic crystals on some, in some video game. Sure. I, 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 absolutely. It's, it's, I like gamification. What I don't like is that a team will say, well, do we get our points or not? And I'm like, did the stakeholder get value? Yeah. That is the number one question. Let's knock off this. And so, but that's a, that's a minor point. 
Um, well, I, I don't, against, I don't right? know. When you get people in your class, and maybe you draw different people than me. I get a lot of people who've never done this stuff. They don't understand mm-hmm. it. They come with all kinds of misconceptions. And that's the part where I'm like, I, I talk about flow metrics. I'm like, you'll, you'll probably end up here, hopefully. But right now, don't even, don't even <laughs> open that door. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do your, are your people able to accept that, that what you're saying about points? Or are they like so wrapped around the axle of it that they can't let go? It's a mixed bag. Um, okay. There, if 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 someone is brand new to this, uh, this is one where um, the the person who's new is more receptive. Okay. Um, what what amazes me if you put a tweet out there and, and if people want to check, it's at Ryan Ripley on Twitter. <laughs> Go take a look at what happens when I start talking about velocity or story points. It just blows up. Yeah, it's like there's a, a lot of emotional. It's it's it, it's so crazy that we're tied to an estimation. Um, methodology or or practice yeah um but i i think the newer people look if you want to use flow metrics you have to be able to count my six-year-old daughter can use flow metrics okay right it, it, cycle time is the number of a, it's the elapsed time from uh, work entering your your workflow to exiting okay uh throughput is the number of items you finish from within a time period in scrum it would be the sprint um, item age, the number of days that an, an item has stayed in a certain in a certain state. Right. Um, whip limits, how many items are allowed to be in a certain stage of your workflow. So if you can count, you can do flow metrics. And these are Kanban. And they're, it's very Kanban easy. Too. Sure. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's that's kind of one of the assumptions. We're we're using um, Kanban principles within a Scrum framework, which I think okay. fits wonderfully. And if you can count um, and visualize your work, I mean, most teams have a JIRA board, they have a Trello right. board, they have a physical board. Um, if you can count and visualize your work, this is all just fine. Okay. Um, when it comes to describing a story point, I don't know where to begin half the time. I have to define effort, I have to define complexity, I have to bring time into it, but it's not about time, but it is about time, depending See, on who you ask. And so that's interesting too, because I do risk complexity and effort. Oh, so let's add in risk, I, because I think that's a good consideration too. So depending on the trainer, the guru, the thought leader, mm-hmm. the expert, um, it's a combination of different things when I'd like to just, I, I, I like to count, you know, at Sesame Street, the count was my guy. Sure. It was well, one, I, uh, 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 and, and you <laughs> did, I, I think it's, let's go that way. It's so easy. And what's interesting, Dave, what I, what I like about this, yeah, because story points are subjective. Yep. They're not granular. They're misused. They're limited, limited in applicability. What I like about those four flow metrics, I can elevate that to a portfolio, and they work yeah. equally well. I can watch. Pro- I can see the no- I can see the cycle time of a project in our organization. Yeah. I can see the throughput over a quarter. I can look at the age of a project over time and see, or a product development effort, and see mm-hmm. which one is is behind the norm. I can limit the the number of projects that we start in our company. And now suddenly I can take a concept from a team level. I can elevate it to a portfolio or organizational level. And everyone knows what I'm talking about. I can't do that with story points. I can't do that with velocity. And it, and so I just, I think from a utility perspective, these ideas are more, more beneficial. And and it just creates this consistent language instead of like, you know, you, I, I love how you highlighted risk. So to Dave, a, a velocity or story point consideration is risk, effort, time. To Ryan, it's complexity, effort, time. To Ron Jeffries, it's a day. To right. Mike Cohn, it's hours. To to the Kretzmans of the world, it's something else. And and instead of having all of that stuff out there, cycle time, throughput, whip limits, and item age are beautifully defined in Dan Vicanti's book, When Will It Be Done? Yeah. You can go read that. You can apply it at the team, at the portfolio, at the org, and it all means the same thing. So I used to put up, I would, when I started teaching Scrum, I would go through all the burned down charts and stuff, and then I'd put yeah. up a cumulative flow diagram and talk about how some people have trouble with certain types of diagrams and explain how when I look at this, all I see is a topsoil diagram from a high school textbook. Yep. And I didn't get them at all, but Dan Vicanti's books, uh, when will it be done? I forget what the other one's called. Actionable agile metrics. That, I was, I was reading, I'm like, Oh my God, like I totally get it. So I, I think very highly of those books. Um, yeah. for any, anybody who's struggling with this stuff, they're really, really well done. And I think the thing that people might not be picking up on that, what you just said about at the portfolio level is you actually can get 
predictability out of yeah. this stuff. We're like, what percentage of a chance do we have that this will be done within this window? You can actually figure that out based on Money. Real data instead of somebody saying, what's our velocity need to be this sprint? Well, then, and then look at the power of that, Dave. I can yeah. walk into a sprint review with real stakeholders sitting there and they can say, hey, when, when, will, when will it be done? which is a question that a lot of agilists are like, you can't ask that. I say nonsense. If it's my money, I can ask you that every day. <laughs> um, I think it's it's the right question that a, a sponsor should or a stakeholder should be asking. Yeah. I can take um, our throughput. I can run that through a Monte Carlo simulation. And I can say, given that we have 27 items in our product backlog and based off of our past performance, you know, through this simulation that's run a million different you know, simulations of, of our situation, right. it's saying that the date with a 85% confidence is uh, February 26th. And they say, well, no, it has to be January 15th. Cool. We're going to take 10 items out of the backlog. <laughs> we're going to run the simulations. And then we're going to fix. And then we can say, look, out of the how many ever were left, you can have 15. Which yeah. 15 are most? So now you're negotiating prior. You're, you're, with you're actual negotiating data instead of emotion. Right. So you're removing emotion from the conversation. You're not having to go through the stakeholder saying, I don't know what the heck a story point is, but you got two weeks and, and all that stuff. Yeah. It's like, here's data. Here's here's a mathematically proven method to forecast off of that data. Here's roughly where we think things could be. Would you like to make a new and better decision based off of what we just learned? Right. That to me is agility. I, I, I think the, the use of velocity and story points is hand waving. And well, it leads to the emotional discussions in sprint reviews. It leads to um, all of this stuff because, look, the bottom line was story points, and I'll never be moved off of this point. Yeah. They were not supposed to leave the team. Totally and agree so, with you. And so if you're using story points and they never leave the scrum team and they're not used for any other decision-making piece other than figuring out our capacity for the next sprint, yeah, go forward, do good things, you know, God bless you. Yeah. But the second they escape your team, you are in a world of hurt. Well, I also think what I what I try to encourage people to do is if some executive says, like, what's the velocity? I think the response should be, what do you need that information for? Like, what will that help you figure out? Because you can probably use what you're talking about to give them the information they're looking for without directly answering their question the way they're asking it. Absolutely. If someone's asking for velocity, if they're trying to figure out when will it be done, well, let's answer that question. Yeah. Here's the other problem with velocity, Dave, that I think gets overlooked. Um, quite often, velocity is an averaging uh, of previous sprints. Yep. So if we did 10 story points in sprint one, 10 and two, 20 and three, so on and so forth, they'll average those. Yeah. And then say our velocity is the average of the last five sprints. Okay. Well, we all know the flaw of averages, but right? So if Bill Gates walks into a bar, on average, every person in the bar is a millionaire. Are you happy with that averaging? Is that even a realistic viewpoint of of the world? I would say no. No, but wouldn't you say that if a product owner is looking at a backlog and they're trying to make a rough guess as to like how many of these should I be able to ask for, that having an average velocity puts them in the neighborhood? No. Okay. But I think I think a, a throughput with a Monte Carlo simulation gives them a better piece okay. of information to yeah, work I with. I can't argue against that. Okay. Um, and that's, and that's the other, I, that's the other, even in the, I've taught this this way. So I'm guilty of this. Like yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a sinner with everybody else. Um, I've taught story points and I've told product owners use this to figure out what the next sprint could be. I'd still rather they write better sprint goals yeah. because most of them are terrible. Yeah. Um, right. Focus on value, right? Mm -hmm. I want the focus there and then we'll back into the, the capacity, but you know, e even then, when they start forecasting off of off of these points, it, it just gets messy. I, but I've taught it that way, and I, you know. So I'm we sorry. both agree you shouldn't, <laughs> but you shouldn't use these for. They shouldn't be outside the team. They shouldn't be shared outside the team. Correct. They shouldn't be used to try to create any level of predictability. You should never believe that they're actually accurate in any way. Like when right. people come in and they're like, I want more accurate estimation. Teach me story points. I'm like, you want fat free fat? That's not such a thing. Um, but. Here's the question I want to ask you. So I did an interview with John Cutler one time and we were talking about sprints and he said, if you're going to use sprints, the question you need to ask is what would you hire the sprint for? So if you were going to hire story point estimation, is there a job that you can think of that you would hire it for that would be beneficial to the team? 
No, I would hire the flow metrics. Okay. I, I mean, I would look at, I look at story points as an unqualified candidate for what I need. Okay. Because you're, I would say you're going after you a more, and... more mature. I would say a more mature, a more, a more reasonable. But you're not putting training wheels on the bike. You're just going to have them ride with two wheels. I think we work. So I, I think that's another. And Dave, I don't. Again, this is not directed at you or anyone else. It's just my my viewpoints have evolved in this space because I, like yeah. I said, I've taught it exactly like you've described. And I just think we're working with adults. Yeah. Um, adults don't need training wheels. Um, I find more often than not, we are teaching, and I've, like I said, I, I'm, I'm in the in, in the trench with everybody else. We're teaching methods that are palatable to modern day organizations, and so there's nothing wrong with that. If you show up and you want to do story point estimation, an executive will look at that and say, "Well, that's not threatening. Go forward and do good things." Mm -hmm. You start looking at cycle time, throughput, whip limits, and item item aging. Suddenly, there's a light on bad decisions. Now yes. you mix in a framework like evidence-based management that starts looking at value delivery, unrealized value, ability to innovate, ability to deliver, or you know, time to market. Right. Now you're in a lot of trouble because now you're shining lights on possible bad decisions. Okay. Right? And and that's where I think the the friction really shows up. Story points are are not intrusive. Um, they're not offensive, they're not um, risky okay. uh, to anyone in power. It's oh, do your cute little team metric. Tell me what your velocity is, and I'll I'll manage that. You bring in some more sophisticated metrics that start giving you better questions to ask. Suddenly, it's like whoa, 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 wait a minute. Why are Why are you looking over in my space? Go back to your team, and yeah. and I think that's where a lot of the friction shows up. Okay, so I want to offer a see if I can offer a valid counter, and it might not work. Um, this is based on stuff I've read by Ron and Chet and conversations I've had with them. Um, if the original definition of a one was a, the pair of developers could deliver it in three days or less if the bastards would leave them alone. So we go with that for a second. Um, I've had conversations with Chet where he's told me if it has more than one acceptance criteria, it's too big. And if you can't finish it by five o'clock, they delete all the code that was written that day and start over because the answer was too complex. Sure. So in that model, the value to me of a one is it's creating or it's demanding a level of discipline on the team's part that they're breaking the work down into these tiny little slices that can all be shippable by the end of the day. And, and yeah. maybe it's just like, um, I don't know, like a support rope or something like that that's helping them while they get that discipline. But I can see value in that. Yeah. Oh, I, I think doing small things and releasing frequently, that's what we should be doing. And now whether it's a planning poker, because you're really talking about planning poker. It's really, we're going to use this tool to break down the work into yeah. something that we could complete by the end of the day. I'm, I'm a fan. Sign me up. Okay. But the second those points have a meaning outside of that discussion. Right. I am. And, and, the, and everyone says, well, you can't make a policy decision based off of what the risks are. But look, uh, I take this back to I think long you, I, In this case, I feel like you can. You can. Well, but I mean, I, I think about lawn darts. Okay. You know, the lawn dart is not inherently evil. It's it's not inherently even a bad idea. They were fun. But after the fifth kid is in the ER because it went through his leg, maybe we should stop playing with lawn darts. Or maybe you just you need know? faster kids with better faster resources. Kids. <laughs> right. But you know what I mean, though? It's I don't yeah. think there's anything evil or wrong about a story point. Um, I don't think it's there's anything evil or misuse. Right. And, and once it... it it's almost like there's there's such a there's such a temptation like it's very hard to keep them within a team because the and look I'm someone will show up and say Ryan's talking about anti management things my career was in executive leadership okay I love management I love leadership um, I've used velocity as a leader incorrectly right I've made these these mistakes sure I want better information for our leaders my job as a trainer or consultant when I'm working with a leader yeah. is to enable them to make new and better decisions repeatedly. Right. I just think the flow metrics give them a better tool set to do that. I agree. And yeah. so, but that's, I think the fact that you're focusing on leadership is a big part of it. Like if we are each chasing down a different problem in a different audience, you're trying to help leaders get better information so they can make better choices. I'm trying to teach project managers to stop treating everything like just duration. 
Love it. Um, and so, and, and to consider other factors. So part of my application is rooted in that. Like, I know I'm creating a problem for you, but I, I don't care <laughs> because I'm trying to save some, fix something else that's right in front of me. Well, you know, I mean, I also, we're also teaching project managers and, yeah. and other people in, in our PSM courses. And, and we've just made the decision that, um, well, something that, that Todd and I do that's going to be a little different than what you would do as a CST is yeah. that we've brought evidence-based management into okay. the discussion. And so I think project, and, and so the, the flow metrics fit into time to market. So mm -hmm. it's one of four areas, one, one of four key value areas that we consider in evidence-based management. And so when we're working with product owners or uh, scrum masters or project managers making the transition, yeah. uh, we're giving them that holistic dashboard, which they love. They're like, hey, I, I have my dashboard again. I, this is familiar territory. And, and <laughs> which so is we're a, trying to... impor very important because it, it adds comfort to this transition. Oh, I, I think that's why we that's why we switched. Yeah. Right. And so and I'm not I, I was a PMI Pembach loving project manager in my career. So I've been there. I've, I've done that stuff, too. When I found evidence based management and as you know, Todd and and, and others have helped me understand it. Um, I think there is a comfort to the dashboard, like looking yeah. at value, looking at time to market, looking at ability to innovate, looking at unrealized value. And they can sit there and go, all right, I'm not losing control of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have some good metrics that I can elevate to a portfolio that I can elevate to an order. And, and use across the portfolio, right? Like all the teams are reporting with the same basic structure. And work towards predictability. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I know that's a dirty word and people are, you can't be predictable. It's agile. It's you can with nonsense. this though. Right. Um, but I think again, that predictability is twofold. Okay. Right? So it, it's measuring good things, but it's also as a, I think scrum masters and especially leaders, especially leaders are accountable for pre predictability. Mm -hmm. If we, we remove all of the organizational impediments that slow a team down, they should become more predictable. Yeah. But only leaders can do that. And it's usually with the assistance of a scrum master or someone else kind of saying, hey, this slows us down and partnering up and doing the right thing. So if leaders truly want predictability, and yeah. I believe they do, for my money, it's focusing on organizational impediments that slow teams down okay. and getting the flow metrics installed as quickly as possible. Okay. So this is a question about your the classes that you and Todd teach. Um, when I'm teaching like a, a CSM class, I'm very focused on trying to get the mechanics sorted out for people and make sure they have as much information as, as I can give them about or help them yep. find how to go be a scrum master. And when they start asking questions about how do I transform my organization, I'm like, go get a coach. Um, because I'd love for you to be able to do that. But right now, I just want you to stop telling the team what to do. Right. Um, how are you working that into your PSM classes or is that happening at a more advanced level, like the evidence-based management and, and the flow metrics and stuff? Yeah, it's, it's largely happening at a more advanced level. Okay. Todd and I have also made the decision that some of this information just needs to be out there. So if you go to the YouTube channel, we have series on evidence-based management. Okay. It's free. I'll put links to that. You know, in the we show have, notes. you know, we've just, we've put all that out there because um, the, the CSM or the PSM, Right. I think you teach a great class. I, I like I said, I, I love Jeff. Uh, there's a Kim Brainerd in your in your mm -hmm. group. Yep. Um, John, John Miller, all these these great people, whether it's CSM or PSM. Right. It's insufficient. OK, it's insufficient. Right. So we are teaching a two day course. And I think the value of these courses, we're going to give you some mechanics. We're going to get you rooted in Scrum. But we're right. also we should be giving you this kind of learning pathway. Yeah. Like here's some really important topics. Go check these out. Here's some, a few books that are going to help you. And over the next couple of years, work through this stuff, mm -hmm. come back and ask questions, right? I'm, my email is full of questions and I'm happy to give a few sentences and answer. Yeah. Um, but work through this. And that's how we handle it too. It's like, there's this topic that we can't cover in two days, but here's, here's 15 videos that Todd and I have recorded. It's seven hours of material or whatever it is. Yeah. Go watch those okay. and, and start working through that. And and so that's kind of, that's how we've handled it. Okay. So I, want, I have another question about the um, the scrum.org classes. So you just mentioned like John and Kim and, and Jeff, we would each teach from the same learning objectives, but we have different ways of going yeah. about doing it. We focus on different things. Um, 
you know, you're talking about teaching them things that they'll carry beyond the class. I spend a lot of time talking about social engineering because to me, that's like the root of how you become successful as a scrum master. Yeah. For you, you're talking about guiding them ta- towards this more advanced level, a way of looking at the work, more mature way of looking at the work. Do all the scrum.org trainers kind of approach it from their own spin or is it more, is it like consistent across everybody? Like, I don't think every trainer has the body of work that Todd and I do. Okay. Um, so yeah, we teach from, we have, it's very similar to what you, you laid out, right? We have very similar, we all have the same objectives we're teaching to. Um, there is a standardized curriculum, but the way that we present it is unique. Okay. And so there is a, there's an ability for, there's a, a myth or a rumor, um, where I've caught a few of your fellow CSTs per kind of I'm never promoting gonna this as well. My fellow <laughs> I know, but but they say that you know Scrum Network trainers are robots. We all teach from the same slide decks. I mean, we're we're a slideless course. We use mural and interactive activities, okay. and of course, Todd and I have put a twist on things, and we we emphasize th- certain things, we de-emphasize others, and and so yeah, there's definitely some some latitude in the way that we teach it. Okay. But no, I would say most trainers um, on our side of the on our side of the aisle, yeah. Um, as if we're Congress, right? Um, I'd say most don't have the the body of work that we do to okay. to teach it in that way, and so the the coverage is going to be different. Okay, but but that's not like um, you're encouraged to bring your own background and your own spin, your own twist. Oh yeah, okay. my my background is executive leadership and being a scrum master. Todd's background is heavy product owner. Okay. Um, with some scrum master and some executive consulting. And so together we cover a lot, if not all the bases that you would expect in a class. Yeah. And, and that's why we teach together. And, um, I, but our backgrounds are different. So our, our approaches are going to be different, varied, right? I think that's important for anybody that's considering taking a class, whether it's scrum alliance or scrum.org. Right. Learn about the person who's going to be teaching your class. Like I'm focusing on project managers. You're focusing on executives. Todd's more product centric. Um, Yep. Everybody's going to have a different way of coming at this. Like John Miller, maybe more education. Um, Oh, wonderful content on Agile in the classroom. Yeah. Excellent. So if you're going to take a class, learn about the people you're going to take it with and make sure you find somebody that is kind of suited for your mindset. Well, and I would say too, look at the body of work. And so you've got, you have a a prolific podcast that people can listen through and get Mm -hmm. a flavor for your approach. I mean, if you're showing up to a class with Todd and I, and you are hardcore velocity and story points, and you think that is the right and true way. Now, if you're looking for a different viewpoint, um, or if you're looking for a different way, come and join us. But if you're convinced this is the only way you're not going to listen to anything else, you're not going to be happy in our class. I think um, if you take any class like this, if you're convinced there's only one way, you're not going to be happy. Right, right, right. Uh, there's many. But yeah, I, but I think that's such a good point. You know, we're learning about, you know, the investment is pretty heavy. Yeah. It's not like we're cheap to to spend time with. We're an expensive date. And so make sure that the conversation is going to be uh, beneficial to liking. you, right? Yeah. Maybe we should have like Tinder for classes. Um. <laughs> so there's Ryan. Swipe left. Swipe left. <laughs> Uh, I think that's how it works, right? I don't know. I've never actually had used Tinder. I have Knock been married we'll never for the need last, to. Uh, since before been, the I've been internet. Married. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm grateful that uh, my dating time was before all this. I've either yeah. been married, engaged, or dating my wife uh, for the past 20 years. So I have no idea what the kids are doing today. Yeah, I don't really want to know. It sounds scary. Um, I, no, I'm good. So I just want to <laughs> summarize before we wrap up. Um, yeah, for for leadership, for management, for understanding things across the portfolio, for understanding what's actually happening, for getting any sense of real predictability, flow metrics is a much better way of understanding what's happening in your organization. Right, hundred percent agree. Okay, but there's also room within a team for the team to use something like poker planning as a tool. Yep to get to a shared understanding of how they're thinking about and looking at the work. Love it. Okay. Just throw away the points. So then what do you, what are you <laughs> using instead? Because you, are you, would, this is actually maybe really good to dig into before we go. Um, would you then score risk, complexity, effort, and you had time in there as well. Would you have a different score for each of those and are they relative or is it just like, this is a chihuahua? 
I, I right. I'm, I'm more in the this is a Chihuahua camp. Okay. We're gonna slice and break down work. We're gonna have a an idea. I'm actually I like the idea of oh, let's try to break it down to roughly a day. Okay, I'm okay with that. But we're gonna use cycle time and throughput to manage to actually look at how thing and item age to see how things are actually going. Okay, and and I think that'll that'll get teams quite far. Yeah. Um, and and look, I also want to throw it out there. Sometimes things can't be broken down as easily as as we wish they could be yeah and so those are those are things you're gonna have to work through and 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 i i think through struggling and pain you learn a lot and you grow yeah and uh sometimes even if it's just the conversation things, and how you're exploring and solving it right right and so sometimes it, it, this is look teamwork is a skill and we have to learn how to work together better i think that is always something you can get better at yeah i think breaking down work is a a very difficult skill it is not a trivial skill, and it's something that we need to. I think you know Neil Killick um, has some really good work out there on slicing. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, Richard Lawrence. There's a few. Ellen Godstein. Yeah, there's. Yeah, yeah. El, oh, Ellen Godstein has uh, her book is out of print, but um, there was a Discover to. I'm trying to see my bookshelf. Discover to deliver, which uh, if you, I think it's a couple hundred bucks on Amazon right now. Um, but it's uh, a great book about, yeah, Ellen has some great work there. Yeah. I know Johanna Rothman is really big yeah. on cost of delay and breaking down work. So there's plenty of material, but you have to put in the effort to actually build the skill up because it is a difficult topic. Yeah. Um, but if you can get that skill, I'd rather you send a team to a slicing course than an estimation course. Ah, okay. You know? Teach them how to break down the work and, and, Cycle time throughput, item age, and whip limits will help. All that stuff will work out. Yeah. Um, I don't want better estimators. I want better under. I want teams to learn how to get a better understanding of their work. And if we get there, I think the estimations and the predictability kind of take care of themselves. Cool. All right. I appreciate you. You. Uh, I, I'm glad that you posted that tweet because it got me all worked <laughs> up. But um, thank you for being open to the conversation too. I think that's. I just want to highlight that too. Is that we teach for different organizations. There's some things we would probably be on the same page on, some things maybe not so much, but sure. I think we both agree that the debate is a healthy thing and being open to having your opinions challenged is really important. Well, oh, Dave, something I, I said, I think, before we hit record is that I'm not sure I'm right. So when I'm making this direct kind of statement, I mean, I, I believe it, but I, be I I'm holding this very strong, direct belief very loosely. Yes. And if someone shows up with better data or a better argument, I'm going to let that go and say, all right, that was a great argument. Cool. Let's, let's look at this again. Yeah. But, and so I think that's an important mindset too. I know you have that as well, yeah. that there's been a number of conversations we've had where I know you've walked away going, huh, oh, I should think about that. I've certainly walked yeah. away from our talks going, oh, he's got a good point about, <laughs> you know, using the, and, 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 it, and that's, that's that's the spirit of this. I I'm that's not the beauty of the community too. Is there's always somebody there who can sharpen you up. Yep. Oh, I, I, always. If you're not learning in this community, you're not paying attention. Yeah. Cool. Well, this was great, man. Thank you for making time for it. If people want to find your podcast, find your book, find your classes, any of the other stuff you do. Yeah, where they I go? think the easiest. I mean, agileforhumans.com will get you there. Okay. Uh, I think it, for the per, for the individual's benefit. Uh, youtube.com slash agile for humans tons of free content okay. check it out leave us uh leave us your comments and uh, let us know how we can help awesome thanks man i appreciate this and happy new year yeah happy new year to you as well